join me in prayer. Lord our God, open our ears, open our minds and our hearts, that we might hear you speak this morning. For you are God, you are our rock, and our salvation. Amen. So for the last several weeks, we have been looking at the great ends of the church, asking that question of, what is church for? Why do we bother? What, what is the purpose for which God established his church? And we have looked at that using a statement adopted by the Presbyterian Church over 100 years ago, a statement entitled, The Great Ends of the Church, or The, the Great Purposes of the Church. And those great ends are the, the proclamation of the gospel for the salvation of humankind, the shelter, nurture, and spiritual fellowship of the children of God, the maintenance of divine worship, <laughs> but if you look on the back of your bulletin, you see it. <laughs> the maintenance of divine worship, the preservation of the truth, the promotion of social righteousness, and the exhibition of the kingdom of God to the world. Those six great ends are not uh, arranged randomly. They didn't just pick them out and then put them in some random order. They, they put them in a specific order, on purpose. You see, we need to hear the gospel proclaimed and respond to it first. And then we, we enter into the body of Christ, spiritual fellowship, where we are sheltered and nurtured, where we begin to heal from our sin sickness. And in doing that, we then gather together to, to praise and glorify our God, as we're doing here this morning. And in worshiping and studying scripture and listening to God's word proclaimed, in doing that, we, we hear truth and are called on to preserve it. But there's more to it than just that. It isn't enough just to, to go to church. It's not enough to have your personal devotion time. It's not enough just to tithe from your wealth. The prophet Michael reminds us that, that God asks that our faith mean something in the way we live. That it extend beyond just our personal piety, our personal devotion. He says, I have shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require? To act justly and love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. Paul's saying something similar to that in our epistle reading this morning. He's saying, yes, you've been saved. You've been saved by grace through faith, by putting your trust in Jesus Christ. It's not works that save us. It's not what we've done. It's not who we are. It's God's mercy. But we don't therefore say, oh, well, there's nothing I can do, so I should just sit back and do nothing. No, Paul says that, that God has prepared good works for us to do. That's what we're here for. That's what the church is present for. And that's what the next great end of the church is about the promotion of social righteousness. Righteousness is one of those terms that, that we use in church that can well, get kind of mushy in its meaning. We talk about social justice, we talk about social righteousness. And it turns out that the justice and righteousness in Greek and in Hebrew, there's, it's the same word. Justice and righteousness aren't two different words, it's the same word. But I really like using the word righteousness because I think it, it echoes what it is that, that righteousness is about. It's about being right with God. It's about things being put to rights. That is something that, that all of us <coughs> love for, all of us recognize. 
Somewhere in us is this desire for things to be right, for things to be just. Last night we were uh, watching for the umpteenth time uh, the, uh, the movie The Princess Bride. It's an old movie, I don't know how many of you have seen it. But the grandfather sitting here telling this story, reading the story to his, his sick grand, grandson. And he comes to a part where the, the evil prince is going on to do something to marry the princess. And, and the boy sits up and says, no, 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 that's not right. That can't happen. That's not the way it should be. We have in us this sense that things should be right. Things should be just. And when they're not that, there's something in us that, that rebels against that. <clears throat> N.T. Wright talks about that. He says that that, that, that idea of, of our longing for justice is something that comes with the kit of being human, he says. It's part of how we're made. He goes on to say that, you know, we, we, seek, we seek justice and we fail, but we, we keep pursuing it. And Christians believe that this is so because all humans have heard, somewhere deep within ourselves, we've heard the echo of a voice which calls us to live with this dream of justice. And followers of Christ believe that Jesus, that in that voice, Jesus, uh, excuse me, that Jesus himself is that voice, and that that voice has become human in the person of Jesus Christ who has begun to bring all that about. That is what Jesus proclaimed in the synagogue that morning. He read that passage from Isaiah about putting the world to rights. And he said, this has been fulfilled in your presence, in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus came to put the world to rights to establish righteousness, to make us in creation right with God. It's a ministry of reconciliation that Paul talks about elsewhere. A ministry of reconciliation that we as the church are to continue. That we are to practice until Christ returns. And that ministry of, of reconciliation, that, that seeking of justice and righteousness, is something we do at an individual level, kind of like I talked with the kids about this morning. We go out and we help individuals where we can. We seek to, to love our neighbor as ourselves, to provide a hand up, to take care of those who are in need. But Timothy Keller reminds us that, that it goes beyond just caring for individuals. Tim Keller, in his book, Generous Justice. He encourages us to think about a, a sequel to the parable of the Good Samaritan. Now you won't remember the, the parable of the Good Samaritan in which this despised Samaritan is traveling along the road between Jericho and Jerusalem. And he comes across this man who has been beaten and robbed and left for dead in the, in the ditch. And the Samaritan binds up his wound and, and puts it in, in an inn and pays the innkeeper to take care of him. <clears throat> and Keller reminds us to, to, or encourages us to think beyond that. He says, imagine that the next day the Samaritan is traveling the road again and, and comes across another person bleeding on the side of the road. A few weeks later, this happens again. And then again. As it turns out, every time he makes the trip from Jerusalem to Jericho, he comes across some, another person who's lying in the road. And then he looks up and he sees that there are hundreds, likewise, lying along the road, beaten and robbed. What should he do? That is the question of social transformation, of social righteousness. When you see one person in need, you help. When you see multitudes in need, you, of course, still give whatever direct help you can. But if you are truly to love your neighbor as yourself, you also need to give thought to how you can address the underlying conditions that are causing so many people to fall into that situation in the first place. As Christians, we need to help individuals who are in trouble, 
individuals who are hurting, individuals who are hurt. But we also need to address the underlying social circumstances that give rise to that. There are a lot of problems in our society. There's great inequity in, in wealth. There are people and children living in, in poverty who don't have enough to eat, even though our grocery stores are filled with food. There are people who don't have adequate, <clears throat> adequate health care, adequate access to doctors, not just in this country, but throughout the world. There are people who don't have clean water to drink. There are all kinds of social ills. And we, as church, are, are called on to, to look at those things and to, to seek ways to address them. Because we are the body of Christ. And the church has always done this. To the extent that sometimes we don't even notice it. We have hospitals because of the church. We have schools because of the church. We have the civil rights movement. Martin Luther King, Jr. got involved in the civil rights movement. Why? Because he was a Christian, and he knew it was the right thing to do. Wilberforce strove to end the tr uh, slave trade in England. Why? Because he was a Christian, and he knew that everyone was created in the image of God, and that the slave trade was wrong. There are social ills that require more than just helping individuals. That's true in the world, it's true in our community. And there are things that we are doing that, that work in those directions. We have Operation Backpack, where we are helping uh, feed elementary age kids who, who don't have food on the weekends so that they can go to school on Monday and be ready to learn because they've had food on the weekends provided through Operation Backpack, so that they're going to be better educated and hopefully able to break that cycle of poverty that has left them hungry on the weekends. We have our school supply ministry that is helping those who can't afford to buy school supplies to be better educated because we make those school supplies available to them. There are things we are doing to address societal problems. And I don't know what we're being called to do as a congregation, as a denomination, as, as the body of Christ. But I know that the way we determine that, the way we find out what we're being called to is to be in prayer. And then when we get up off our knees in prayer, to open our eyes and look around to where God is calling us to act. And as Christians, it's, that's just part of our calling. That's why we're here. And as we pursue that, we also fulfill that last great end of the church, the exhibition of the kingdom of God to the world. Jesus taught us when we pray to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Not just to focus on you know, someday going off to heaven and leaving this place. But on bringing heaven here, bringing the, ki the kingdom of heaven into the lives we live, into the lives that are around us, so that they can see what it is for things to be put to rights. So that they can see the gospel proclaimed and people gathering in, in spiritual fellowship, so they can, can experience worship, <coughs> and hear the truth so they can participate in what God is doing to put the world to rights in our society. All those things exhibit the kingdom of God so that others want to get involved, to participate, to join into the body of Christ, to acknowledge Jesus is Lord of it all, to recognize that, that the kingdom of God is being established right now and that we are God's stewards, caring for his kingdom until our king, Jesus Christ, returns. Those are the things we are called to be and to do as church. So let us do them. 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. 